Okay, fantastic. Well, it is so good to be together with, uh, at least in our virtual reality together, with, with uh, um, six people from COTA. And um, it's just a joy to be with you. I'm just going to ask you all a few questions. We're going to have some fun and uh, you can tell us about uh, the things you've discovered during the last bizarre year and uh, the things you found interesting and the things you found horrible. So uh, that'll be great. Uh, let's maybe just go around and introduce each other. So. Um, um, Sam um, is a professor of graphic design and the program head, and you have a background in biomedical engineering, and you see design as a practice between art and system engineering and linguistics. So fascinating right there. So welcome, Sam. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Rebecca or Becca Lemma is a professor of modern dance and ballet uh, who mentors students in their own choreographic work and is the co-coordinator uh, of our BFA, BFA program. program. So, so welcome back. Thank you very much. Eduardo Pérez, with a beautiful background, uh, is a professor of design as well, uh, program coordinator, advisor for the BFA in interior design, and you are, Eduardo, the faculty member in charge of the CSULB IIDA Campus Center. So welcome, Eduardo. Thank you. Um, David Waldman uh, is a professor of cinematography and a professional cinematographer working in the field. An experienced and celebrated, indeed, cinematographer who's shot TED Talks, commercials, many TV series and music videos. So, David, please forgive the, uh, the amateur nature of this particular uh, uh, venture and uh, welcome to our welcome to. Our... Thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. And uh, Josh Palkey. Uh, is a professor of vocal and choral music education, leads the university choir, which as we know is world famous, teaches courses in music education, passionate about preparing teachers to be competent and caring with the knowledge and skills to address issues of social justice through music education. And one cannot imagine a more important job than that. So welcome, Josh. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And uh, last but by no means least, Gail Bazer, a professor of makeup design within theatre arts, uh, nationally acclaimed for her work, which ranges from film and TV costume design, concert tours, costume illustrating, book illustrating, and much more. So welcome, Gail. And uh, it's so great to have you all here. Uh, for those of you watching, uh, I think everyone knows me, but in case... Uh, somebody doesn't. Uh, I'm the provost and uh, have been honored to be the, in that position for the last uh, four and a half years at Cal State Long Beach. So let's kick off with, uh, with an easy question. So um, Eduardo, how did, how did you come to work at, at Cal State Long Beach? What do we owe our great success? <laughs> um. You know, uh, I think it started way back when I was in college. You know, I started off in community college. I didn't know if I wanted to go into architecture, civil engineering. I still had a budding baseball career. I was a, I was a walk on. I wasn't recruited. You know, my, my son's recruited. He's playing college ball, so it's great for him. But uh, for myself, I was still trying to figure myself out. And I really uh, created a. Or I shouldn't say I created. I would say I, I was I was honored to have been in a course with uh, Dr. Osamu Wakita who ultimately turned out to be um, kind of a second father for me. My parents weren't educated. You know, they emigrated in, in the 50s to this country and they didn't even complete high school. Um, Dr. Wakita took me under his wing and just kind of the, the repertoire of kind of life skills, not so much even the, the technical skills, which ultimately I excelled in. Um, he, he created a passion for me. And that, that passion continued to grow as, as an architect working in design firms and mentoring younger students and then, you know, getting my feet wet working in, in, in a couple of different community colleges in the architecture department. And then ultimately, one day I just saw an ad in a trade magazine for CSULB, one of those kind of lunch lunchtime things, just opening up the magazine. I'm like, 
okay, maybe now's the time. And I just kind of put things together and, and not the most professional manner, to be honest with you, because I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to give it a shot. And then I get a call from, at that time, um, um, my, my department chair, who's who's graphic designer, um, Tor, Tor Hoven. And, uh, you know, he's, he said, we'd like to, for you to come on board and, uh, you know, let, let, let's, let's begin a conversation. And here I am, 14 years later, love this job. Absolutely. It's not a job. It's awesome. I just want to get back in the studios. <laughs> yeah, and we all. Sort yeah, of just, yeah, but yeah. but that's kind of the short version. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Well, it's uh, it's like the usual story: serendipity and being in the right place at the right time. Anyway, yeah. that's great. We're lucky, and we're pleased to have you. Awesome. Thank so, you. Um, uh, Becca, we won't go through the same questions over and over, but I mean, uh, let's let's talk about our COVID situation and uh, these, these really strange, strange AMI, AMI uh, uh, alternative modes of instruction that we've all been dealing, dealing with. How how managed, managed as, as, as a dance and LA choreographer? Well, as you can imagine, it's challenging. <laughs> it's challenging. Um, not only because you know like so many art forms it's a it's about a communal experience it's about being in space together um it's also about space it's about moving in space um which is extremely challenging um when students are at home um i think one of the things that has become very apparent for me during this time is um how different the circumstances are of every single one of our students and how mm -hmm. much we have to be adaptable to make things work for them it's not only about their physical space it's about who they're sharing space with if they have control of their space if they're supported in their space um and so that's that's been one of the huge pivots actually that i think all of us in the dance department have had to make is really um, kind of understanding what the unique circumstances are of each of our students, um, working with them, finding ways um, of trying to adapt whatever it is that we're doing, um, allowing them to do things asynchronously if synchronous activities don't work. Um, we've been, God bless our uh, technical coordinator, Stephanie Lesleben, she's been cutting individual pieces of dance floor to send home with students so they have surfaces that they can move on. Wow. She's, I don't know how many rolls of Marley she's cut up, but she's been working really hard um, trying to make things, you know, a little bit easier for our students at home. Um, but the beautiful thing that I think we've discovered is that you can still build community through the screen. <laughs> Um, I was teaching an advanced improvisation class in the fall, which I was fairly um, nervous to teach over Zoom. <laughs> it was supposed to be an ensemble improvisation class where everyone's responding to everyone else and you're looking at this little screen. Um, but I think we were able to find a way to communicate with each other non-verbally, a way to try to transfer energy between people and ultimately a way to allow the students to feel like they were still having some sort of um, experience that connected them to other people, which is, I think, maybe for all of us, the most difficult thing right now is feeling isolated and disconnected. So um, although it's difficult to do things in the way that we are now, it, it feels even more critical to try to find um, sort of the essence of, of what it is we're doing um, through finding that, that way of still being together. Incredibly impressed by the ability of our faculty to 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 just um, as you say pivot on a dime and transform you know personal and uh, space based and uh, activity based uh, not to mention face to face instruction based uh, education at this level almost overnight to to a brand new method and i think it's a testament to you all so you know let me say publicly thank you for everything you've done but um i do know that our students really appreciate that so amazing amazing achievements i, I mean josh we're talking about um the the great variety among our students in 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 living circumstances in 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 other things um, and of course that has tremendous social justice implications but based on your teaching or, or research or scholarly activity creative activity what, what 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 solutions or recommendations have come to your mind that 
that we should implement or stop implementing down the road? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. And I and I love what Becca said. You know, I think one of the things that I hope will come out of this is that there seems to be such a, a, a focus on socio-emotional learning, you know, because you know, we're you know, we're we're artists. We 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 work with a lot of you know, musicians, we work with a lot of feelings and, you know, expressing how we feel through music. And, and if students don't feel safe in their space, in their home, you know, they, it's, it's impossible almost to, to have that artistic expression happen. So I'm really hoping that that carries over. I really hope that this, this emphasis on socio-emotional learning will carry through even when we go back to whatever the next phase of, of higher education is. Uh, you know, and and I, I work with a, a research group in the College of Education, and we spend a lot of time talking about culturally responsive teaching, and that's a, a, a huge part of that, right? So giving students what they need individually to succeed, right? It's like that, if you've seen the graphic that, uh, you know, it's the difference between equity and equality, right? So you know, we, we don't want to treat, treat all of our students the same, right? Because all of our students have unique needs and we're definitely seeing that this semester or, or this, this you know, during this period of, of AMI where, where like Rebecca said, I mean, there are, are students who, you know, some of our music students are sharing apartments with four other people and they, they don't have anywhere to practice, right? Because you don't want to like stand in your closet and sing an aria, right? So like just, I mean, we have, we have you know, saxophonists that are practicing in parks and we have, you know, um, vocalists that are using local churches that aren't being used to practice. And, you know, so um, I think in terms of justice implications, I think we should really continue to bear in mind all that our students go through. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. It's, you know, what, what, what's always struck me about education is that at bottom, it's, a, it's, a, it's about personal relationships and the uh, relationship that as an instructor, one develops with one's students and vice versa is, is the basis, I think, of all learning. And uh, to Becca's very good point, who, who could have imagined that we could still, to some extent at any rate, establish relationships with each other through, through this really rather foreign and, and, and uh, far away medium. But yet we can, and uh, difficult though it is, we can still guide our students, they can inspire us, and uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing, how resilient we are. Um, Sam, um, I remember uh, I met Sam, by the way, at a at a party uh, of friends, musicians. Uh, my partner plays the piano, and Sam was 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 at that party, and so we we've, we've known each other for a while. But what, what what advice do you have for our students in sort of these times? How how have you adapted your your teaching and and creativity to to this new reality um well thanks brian for giving me this opportunity it's an honor to be here and uh, with everyone else um for the students i always tell them um, it takes two to tango and um, we are in a tough situation but it's not just you we are also got hit by this severely especially faculty um depends and we have a diverse range of uh, faculty um those who are your you you got locked down with your family they, they they have the same situation and they have to also provide and babysit their young uh, kids and all of these things are just it's not like you if you give uh, build resentment and feel like something was taken away from you guess what it's happening to the whole world um so that helps to just go a little bit of uh, understanding and building em uh, empathy with each other the thing that helped me during this time was um I thought about the whole mode of remote working that uh, a lot of us in the industry have been doing it. Like um, uh, I have worked with a group of programmers in Chennai in India, 
um, or with the, I have clients across the country. Sometimes you have to wake up five in the morning to make it for a meeting a sharp in New York. So I thought, well, how those things taught me to, to, to communicate well. Everything has to be very well documented. Everything has to be very clear in the communication. So I, it, it was not easy to just suddenly adapt to the whole thing and especially just train everyone, especially the students. I always look at it like I'm coaching a team to just go through uh, and, and teach them about something like I found it surprisingly to myself that well sharing my calendar and showing them how I keep my track of my time was a learning experience instead of just focusing on teaching them about like visual design that we always do in the class so um, adapting to that technique helped me a lot and I feel like students are also reciprocating because I always tell them there is a reason you're sitting here going through these rough times and is still willing to jump through hoops to go online and meet us why because you're seeking knowledge and you you deserve to be here and you're going to the one of the best universities and one of the best spots in the world people want or willing to give an arm and leg to just come to California and go to public uh, great university like here so i think that's that's the way it takes a lot of uh, talking and pep talking and just hey don't give up we are still in the week four we still have 12 more weeks it's not time to give up and that's how it is <laughs> you've certainly inspired me so um gail what what advice would you have for the administration what can we do and i mean you know sam brought up a very interesting point of the effect of this um this uh, this pandemic on our faculty and as the data appear to show that especially women faculty um but in general people who caring for for parents or children are are, are severely affected um what advice would you would you have for me how can i help Wow, <laughs> that's a loaded gun. <laughs> um, thank you for having me here, first of all. And secondly, I think it would be, let's keep the arts strong. Let's keep going with something that comes from the heart and the soul. We're not all brain surgeons, but the kids, react positively in a safe environment where they can express their creativity. And that's really what we're doing. They're growing and they're learning. It's not making any difference if they're on Zoom or if they're in class on campus, at least for me and for my students, because I've kind of gotten through, I figured out just laugh through it. If it's a bad project, if it's a good project, learn by it. That's all that matters. You're here to learn and enjoy the process. And I found that they turn in incredible work because of it. And I keep encouraging them. I haven't lost any students, so that must be a good sign. I don't know, but I really, I mean, that's what keeps me going. That's the gift that they give me as faculty. It's just such a joy to be able to do that with them. I just absolutely love that comment, Gail. Thanks. And I mean, you know, the, the joy of learning is what I think keeps us all here. And it, it truly is a joy. Uh, and the fact that you're able to uh, evoke it and, and promote it, well, congratulations. In these times, that's exceptional. So thank you. Um, Sort of moving on to to actually what Gail talked about, the future of the arts. And I mean, you know, let me express to those of you watching who may think of me as a as a dry and boring statistician, but I know very well the centrality and importance of the arts to to being human, and um, therefore. Uh, the arts and the humanities are, are as they always have been, the central uh, feature of any university of note. Um, David, what, what do you think the future of COTA is going to be? Do you think it's sort of pushed to one side because of COVID? Do you think this is just a detour that we'll go back to where we were? What, what, what's the future going to look like? The future for us is an emphasis on STEAM rather than STEM. And, and I think if, if, if this experience for the average uh, human being in North America has taught us anything, it's the need and the importance for 
the things that we all do, you know, and, and uh, Provost Jersky, as you very rightly uh, identified, it's what makes us human, right? We all love to do our taxes. I mean, that's, that's, you know, oh, yes. Gosh, looking forward. Them. I've been looking forward to it all year. Yeah. We, we live for it. And, and occasionally we watch Netflix, but, um, so this is really an opportunity for, for the uh, administration to stop talking about STEM and really start talking about STEAM consistently because we really need as many resources as everybody else. And in some cases we need more. Yeah. Um, in terms of the future of CODA, I think that this has really allowed us uh, as faculty to, to shed some things that maybe weren't working so well, but that we were super attached to because because we're used to it. And, and and again, I'm speaking for me, this was my experience, was this, uh, I spent the summer completely tearing down and rebuilding my courses. And, and I'm glad that I got the opportunity to do that because I have learned a lot of, of uh, I've identified things that, that maybe uh, I'm gonna jettison forever. And I've also identified things that even though the mode is teaching online, I'll keep these assignments and these experiences for the students, even if we ever get back to a hundred percent in-person learning. Yeah. That's fascinating. And you know, uh, what I've been thinking of just in the last few days are, is um, the incredible scientific achievement of, of being able to uh, drop a rover on Mars, but also the incredible uh, um, emotional, artistic, uh, the, the beauty of it. Um, and that appreciation, which makes us full human beings, as you said, of, you know, we're, we're not just engineers. Uh, there's also that beauty of little dust swirls on, on another planet that uh, we've seen for the first time. Amazing. It's, um, you, you talked about changing teaching strategy, and that, that's something that I'm really curious to hear about. <laughs> Others, I mean, have you, do you do you sort of agree with David that there's some things that you're going to change going forward, or are you looking forward just to getting back in the studio and doing doing the same thing? You know, it's really interesting because the only thing I think that's really lacking right now, where we went from hands-on learning to a flat formula. Hmm. And so we had to overcome the flat formula and maybe overemphasize what we would normally teach in the classroom mm -hmm. so that the students feel like, okay, well, we're still involved. We're still an integral part of what's being taught and what we're learning. And I'm constantly monitoring that. And I think that's something that we would carry back onto campus that definitely there's another element that maybe we get complacent a little bit sometimes or we think i just don't have time for this today something but the students are still going to be the number one priority no matter what we decide to do and we want to encourage that creativity and the creative process is tough it's exhausting pulling all of that fabulous stuff out of you no matter what it is is if it's a creative process so i think that, that those are things that we want to maybe look at and be proud of and continue yes i i am absolutely in awe of all of you for being able to continue to pull out that creativity and innovation and and creation up of, of art and music and dance and design of our students in these circumstances. And so I'm, I'm just fascinated to hear, you know, the, the, the varying points of view. Um, anyone else? Teaching strategies, how, how, are we going to, how are we going to go forward, Eduardo? Yeah, I think some of the things that, you know, as far as strategizing, and it'd be kind of curious to, you know, with 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 my my colleagues here from CODA, I, I think some of the the things that I've seen and speaking with my my faculty members in design, because we've had tons of dialogue, I think that we found that the students that would succeed in person are still succeeding in the virtual environment. Mm -hmm. There's maybe there's maybe a, a less percentage of that top echelon because some are just 
introverted, extroverted, maybe some of these modes of teaching are maybe a little bit more difficult to communicate digitally through this through, through this, the, this element of the digital world. Um, and then also the ones that are, that are being challenged are still the ones that were possibly gonna be challenged face to face. So I know for me personally, I take it very personal when I, when I feel like I let a student down and you know I'm constantly being self-critical. Okay, what else can I do? What else can I do? Um, and there are some intangibles that I think we're missing from the face to face world. Kind of the, the, the hallway conversations, yes. the, the door is open in your office and the student comes in with that aha moment that just kind of struck them while they were eating a sandwich, you know, and we could, you know, so a lot of a lot of those things that happen outside the studio are very mm -hmm. difficult to parallel, even try to mimic. But we're doing the best we can, obviously. But but we definitely miss on those, those little kind of intangible moments that ultimately are the, the great kind of peripheral uh, elements on the side of the road, right? I think we're all we get caught up with that central vision and that goal in hand, but we got to turn our heads a little bit. And sometimes that turning the head happens in the hallway. And so those are the things that have become really frustrated with me, as well as I have a lot of international students, as many of you guys probably as, do as well, too. Um, I, I'm, I'm working not nine to five. I'm working kind of 24 seven because it's, it's not their fault that they're in Asia and 9 p.m., 10 p.m. works better for them. And now they had to take on a job to help out their family make ends meet. So um, adding a little bit more of kind of the rigor of, of the screen, what we can do to help globally um, that, that has been a challenge, but it, it has definitely made a connection with me and that, that overall empathy, which my colleagues have stated in kind of different degrees. Uh, and, and I think that's ultimately going to make us no doubt better, not just as educators, but, but as people. And whatever we can do, whatever those little kind of fragments of sensitivity, of still being very critical and challenging them, because we have to, we have to challenge, right? We have to take it to that to that cliff's edge of being fearless with their curiosities and their explorations and understand that they're going to fail they're going to succeed but but just being able to take that deeper breath to try to understand their situation and try to modify our personal methodologies to make those connections and it, and it's a work in progress as we all know you know we're, sure. we're trying like crazy um yeah i think what's what's fascinating what what's always been fascinating for me about teaching is how is how little i know I mean, I've been teaching for 25 years or 30 years or whatever it is. And, you know, in some ways I'm quite confident in what I do and in other ways I'm not. And, you know, now we have this brand new form of teaching, which I haven't really had the good fortune to be to be part of. And uh, there's a whole new set of things that, that uh, uh, I'm not competent in, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. I think we're all, you know, type A, and we expect perfection all the time from all of us. And of course, being human, that's not attainable. Um, but uh, I mean, Josh, I'm, I'm so fascinated. I was so amused by your, um, you know, singing an aria in the closet and um, I was thinking, you know, the only place I'm ever going to sing an aria is maybe the shower. But I mean, <laughs> uh, what what kinds of how have you been teaching differently given this um, method in in teaching people choral singing? Yeah. So I love what Eduardo said, and 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 I think I'll, I'll echo that. You know, I think flexibility and vulnerability on the behalf on our part has been really important or i'll speak for myself you know um in one in my choral methods class this semester i had this project that i thought was going to be really cool and i introduced it and then as they got into starting it i was like this does not work online and so we scrapped it you know and so me being able to say like i thought this was going to work it didn't work i think allows them to be more vulnerable and to to make mistakes as well um yeah, it is very odd to be training people to be doing something that you cannot do, right? I mean, singing is a super spreader event. So choral singing is like the most dangerous thing you can do right now. So uh, it's, I'm trying in my pedagogy courses to mix, you're going to like, there's going to be choral singing again one day. So you need to be ready to do that because that's what your job is going to require of you. But also, I mean, I have to really brag on our music ed area because we have 
already for many years taken a quite progressive view of what music education is, right? Because in America at the secondary level, music education has become band, choir, and orchestra, right? Very traditional. And that doesn't speak to everyone, right? So the best, the best research we have says between 12 and 20% of American high school kids enroll in those ensembles. Mm -hmm. And so we spent a lot of time talking about and thinking about, well, what about the other 80%, right? I've never met anyone who hates music, right? So what kind of courses will speak to those students, right? Maybe it's hip hop beat production, maybe it's songwriting, maybe it's mariachi, depending on where you are. And we've been thinking about and training our students to do that for years, which has put us light years ahead of other universities. So um, I'm just, I'm so proud to be part of this department and, and, and um, yeah, and, and watching our students sort of navigating what music education is becoming, right? Because you've got choral teachers all over the country that are not able to do anything that looks like choral singing, right? And so they're doing all sorts of interesting creativity of, uh, activities and composition and improvisation. And, and I see, we've seen for a while, that's where music education is going. So balancing tradition and, and more progressive views is, uh, has been really cool to be part of. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm so impressed by, you know, the progressivity of Cal State Long Beach's uh, College of the Arts in general. Um, th there's a quite a famous article, uh, which I'm sure you've, you've read, which is, imagine if we taught uh, music the same way we teach math. Um, and uh, everyone, of course, would hate it, uh, as, they, as they hate math. Uh, and uh, I can say that as a mathematician, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's a true fact that you know, that, that searching for something that we know all humans relate to, whether it's movement, uh, uh, dance, uh, art, um, is, 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 it's a great, it's a great achievement. Uh, Becca, I know you actually have a class to teach in a few minutes. So, I mean, uh, I just wanted to sort of ask you an easy question before you disappear is, have you come up with any new hobbies or exciting, fun things that you're doing um, in the last year? I mean, I know everyone's sort of been baking bread or something, but <laughs> I'm not baked any bread. I'm not a I'm not a cook. I'm not. <laughs> I don't bake. Um, I did adopt a dog actually almost a year ago, and so he has become my hobby. <laughs> Um, he's a rescue dog and he, I'm actually surprised he hasn't made an appearance yet. He may realize I'm speaking about him and come and show his face, but, um, I'm, I'm a huge nature lover. I love getting outside. And so it's been really fun getting to take him along for little adventures. Um, I don't live in Long Beach. And so now that I don't have a commute, that's like an hour each direction, I suddenly have a morning that I can get up and like, you know, get outside and, and do something for myself before I, I teach all day. And so that's been something that's been really getting me through, um, trying to get to the mountains, trying to get to the beach, um, just allowing myself to sort of feel very disconnected from technology for a short period of time um, before I come and stare at the screen all day. Um, and that's something I've been encouraging my students to try to do as well, which I think is exceptionally challenging for them right now to find time for themselves. Um, they are, if they're not on Zoom, they're doing homework or they're going to work. And, you know, I think they, they feel very much kind of connected to this technology right now. So I've been trying to encourage them to take time away. Um, I think it's really soul cleansing for all of us. Um, so yeah, and now I have an excuse because I have to exercise my dog. Yeah, I, I, it's um, well, that's fascinating. And what you said totally resonates <clears throat> with me, which is, I think, one of the things that we're going to see at the end of this um, pandemic is that perhaps uh, us urbanites will, will, will be more in touch with nature and, uh, and, and, and less focused on the concrete. Not, not that there's anything wrong with cities. I love cities, but... Um, just as you say, being in touch with nature, being in touch with animals, plants. Uh, I know our garden has been a lifesaver for me. Um, Sam, I jumped over you. Um, uh, you 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 were going to talk about teaching, I think. So sorry about that, but uh, let's jump back to you and and 
the floor is yours. I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation. This is really uh, fascinating. Uh, one thing I just wanted to talk about, um, um, I think that was a question came up a bit earlier. I just want to iterate on it, um, on future of CODA and art. Um, and, and, I, and Brian, uh, allow me to do this a little bit, uh, tease with the mathematicians and engineers, because I come from that background. So I respect them very well. I, I, I you know, I, I belong to both worlds in that term. But I believe that um, it's the, you know, engineers um, will put human on Mars, but it's the artist who will define how this human is going to live there and, and what is going to be. I had, um, I had a couple of speakers from NASA JPL in the past four years. And it's very interesting. All of them started in arts. One of them is now, she started in the music and now she is one of those who were in the uh, technicians who are working, uh, engineers who are working on the user experience of the panel that controls the Mars rover. Mm -hmm. Or um, you see this SpaceX, they just launched their um, great uh, mission last uh, May. Um, to, to go to the space station, but all of the interface, all of the all of the system that were designed by SpaceX now is all digital and how a human is going to interact with those things. That's art. Like art is not always like paintings or, or um, even the paintings. Uh, it's very important. That's what I'm trying to say. I think that it goes into little um, little boxes when we think of okay what is the future of this i think i see everything as art um engineer is the one who builds the car but it's an artist who who gives the shape and beauty of that car and that's why we all want to have we, we one chooses this car versus the other car at the end the engine works and functions per, pretty well and i feel like from the engineering side it's also the same if if someone is just looking at the engineering and just just trying to make things work then it will become functional but it may not have a soul and that's what I see. In, um, and I also see a lot of people who started in performing arts and then ended up doing some amazing, as I said, in the JPL. I have four friends and they came to spook, speak at, to the students. All four of them started as artists. And now they are be emerged into different things. So I feel like the future of Kota is very bright. We are, we are developing thinkers. We are, we, are, we are developing resourceful people who at this stage that they may come to my class or to anyone else's class, how old are they? In their, in their very early stages of their developing their future and thinking what they want. But we give them uh, resources to think and to develop. And that will, that the, the, if they can take it as far as they are willing to do. Just wanted to right. add that. I completely support and, and uh, understand what you're saying because um, I think one of the great uh, sadnesses of, of current or recent Western civilization is, is the split between, the artificial split between, uh, between areas of knowledge and areas of interest. And, you know, we, we, we've duplicated it at the university with our, with our little silos, you know, the college of this and the college of that and the department of this and the department of that. Um, of course, um, I think you've all heard me talk about we, we don't have silos, we have cylinders of excellence. But, um, you know, within our little cylinders, we're kind of hermetically sealed from, from all the rest of the human experience. And that's, uh, that's completely, completely false. So I too, I, 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 you know, when I, when I look at the future of COTA or the future of higher education, I see a, a reuniting of, um, of knowledge. And that means that we're going to have to think in difficult and new ways, you know, how do we break down departmental barriers? How do we eliminate bureaucracy that, well, you know, your RTP and this RTP is different. And, you know, yes, of course, I understand that there are different fields and different uh, areas of, of, of expertise, but um, I, I think it's very exciting. Um, I, uh, Keeping, you know, keeping the art strong is something that um, I think universities have a have a key role in playing. Um, but I think keeping keeping thinking strong, 
keeping progress, human progress. And as, as you, um, there's so many areas in which that happens. It's, um, David, we were, and this may be of interest to you, but I was, I was watching this, um, this latest uh, Apple TV thing, what's it called, with the with the football player who goes to England or something, um, and Lasso. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Lasso. Thanks, Becca. It's, uh, I'm having a senior moment. Can't remember his last name, but uh, you know, just that kind of humanizing of of kindness and. Uh, and positivity and and giving is is what education is all about. So um, I don't know. But how how do you think how do you think film is going to go into the future? That's <clears throat> that's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> because <laughs> we're you know there's it's very difficult to silo and kind of completely virtualify uh, the collaborative nature of making a feature film or feature television uh, project, just like a traditional narrative. And there are experimental things that are being done right now. I'm directing as, you know, as you mentioned before, like I've been doing directing TED Talks from this room around the world. I was in Finland this morning at five. I was in South Africa this morning at six. Like it's oh. crazy. I don't have to get on a plane anymore. However, the 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 collaborative nature of what we do is still going to need to be collaborative we're going to need to have actors and you know other artists like cinematographers or technicians uh in the same space to to be able to do what we do so i don't think that it's going to all of a sudden become green screens everywhere and virtual production everywhere. I don't think that, I, I think that there are many people who are pitching that right now, but I also think that that's not only disingenuous, but I think it's ill-informed because there that's not, we can incorporate bits of that, but I can't imagine that we all are all of a sudden going to have a different opinion about uh, a green screen background. We've been looking at visual effects for years and it's the rare project that creates real connection you know, uh, using those means. Um, so I think we, uh, I mean, what we're trying to do in FEA is be format agnostic and train, uh, train our students to be storytellers and to be nimble and to be resourceful and not be beholden to certain technologies. You know, we, I sent my lighting students this semester a flashlight and some lighting gel, you know, and that's how they're learning to light everything from, you know, a human face to five city blocks. It's all scalable, you know, and, and, and they really do need to understand that what we're doing, sorry, that what we do out in the field, like Sam was saying, is we are resilient and we have to be nimble and we as professionals have to adjust. So they have to adjust. Do you know, so, so we're kind of teaching them life skills that are actually going to live far beyond the pandemic and actually make them more um, better collaborators and better communicators and hopefully, you know, people who are uh, making observations about the human condition long after this in whatever, whatever manner they decide they're going to do that. Amazing. I'm not sure um, I answered your question, but that's how. No, I it's, it's, it. <laughs> it's you know, in a way, the the the, the question is really just to uh, inspire discussion, not really to get a particular answer. But I, I'm dying to see, you know, what what, what is the, uh, the what what are our students? How are they going to choreograph their story of 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 the pandemic? And I don't know if you've seen any inklings of it, Becca, and I know you're about to go, but um, is, is, is there any, anything that you've seen sort of sitting in the back of students' minds and percolating through? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I love what David was saying about being agnostic about <laughs> how things are going to happen. Like, um, the students have become so facile, actually, in... Mm -hmm 
in film, like trying to start to do things for camera um, and thinking about the solo body, thinking about bodies in non-traditional spaces. Um, so in terms of their art making, they're being really um, sort of inventive and, and reimagining what that can look like. But I think in terms of what that translates into in terms of their future, um, I think this time is gonna be really transformative and mm. um, I think it's gonna help them become better entrepreneurs and independent artists because they've had to sort of wipe the slate clean of what they were expecting to do when they graduated. Um, and I think a lot of artists, but dancers in particular have to sort of have that um, sort of mind for creating their own work, for creating their own projects. Um, long, long ago, we sort of lost that dream of everyone who graduates with a, a degree in dance is gonna join some famous world traveling dance company. Like that model's not really happening anyway, e even before the pandemic. Um, and so they're they're figuring out how to collaborate with each other. They're figuring out how to um, do things on a shoestring budget that become really exciting. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think the arts are a really great example of not siloing yourself, mm -hmm. like having to work with different kinds of people in order to get your dream off the ground. Um, and so I, I see them doing that with each other and I'm, I'm really eager for, um, for them to kind of implement that in the real world once they're, once I, the safety net. I can't year. wait. And I think it's that, that creativity that the new environment has produced. And I mean, Gail, for example, I know you've been doing amazing things with, with makeup online. And, you know, you think about, well, how much more, you know, tactile, personal can, can that be? But tell us what made you think of using makeup in the new environment so effectively. Well, price had a lot to do with it, very honestly. <laughs> Makeup supplies are very, very costly. And all of a sudden, I couldn't help really with the supplies because we're not on campus. So I had to finagle my wonderful suppliers to give discounts to my students and let them buy what they needed. But there's still some that don't have those resources, you know, the financial resources. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Let's use non-traditional materials. What can you come up with? Step out of your comfort zone, step out of the box and let's get really creative and have fun with it. You may succeed or you may not succeed. You know, why not take mud and water or berries and make a paste out of them to use as makeup? And they've been doing that and having a ball with it. And it's so exciting to see. They, you know, they see me sitting here bouncing off the chair with excitement about something that they've done, a technique or something. And they're looking at me like I'm completely insane, which I probably am at this point. You know, um, it's, you know what the, I, I think the excitement of, of the arts, the excitement of creativity, you've all uh, just brought it so much to, to the little rectangles that we've been sitting in. So thank you. And um, I, I kind of think that, you know, like most crises, um, this crisis is going to affect the arts um, in general. And, uh, you know, it, it may be, it may have negative effects, but I, from, from what you've all said, it sounds like they're really positive effects uh, that you've thought of new things your students are doing new uh bases for for their creativity you you've given them permission to expand and be creative and that 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 is that is an amazing an amazing achievement so i think i think we all at the university going back to to the whole university we all have things to learn from you and what I would like to see, not that I'll be here, but what I would like to see at the university is ways in which you and other creative faculty can share with each other the, the practices that you've evolved, discovered, uh, created, um, because I think they apply in other fields too. And no doubt other faculty have been equally creative in, in other ways. It's that um, we, we kind of, 
I've always thought that part of the problem with our silos is that we kind of, you know, we get thrown into a department, uh, Sam, whether it's engineering or design or, or dance or whatever it is, and then we kind of stay there and we never meet other people. It's really hard to meet other people because when you do, you're working on policies and procedures and work. And, uh, we, we, we need more time. Um, of course, Eduardo is working 24-7, appearing to teach the entire world. <laughs> and boy, that's a tough thing. But, uh, but maybe even there, maybe there's some kind of way we can open up the time zones. And why do we have to traditionally work between, between 8 and 8 or whatever? Maybe some people would prefer working from 3 to 4 in the morning or something. Um, anyway, um, well, Becca had to go and teach, and I'm sure you all have uh, have, have have things to do. But uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to just speak to us and share your great success with with whoever's watching this podcast. And I think that uh, anyone who watches this will come away knowing that Kota is strong. It is central and key point, what absolutely great faculty and uh, artists you all are. So thank you.